So my name is Glenda and I'm a foster carer with Auschild and we have, my husband Paul and I have been carers for um, well over 20 years and had quite a number of children in that time. Um, we have two birth children of our own. So we were just married um, only a year or so within our first year of marriage and we weren't ready to have children yet. We both were working full time. I just bought a hairdressing salon actually. Um, and we, and my husband worked in the city. So we just wanted to do some weekend, big brother, big sister stuff. And we saw an ad on television, a stupid ad about foster care. Oh, I say stupid now, cause it was a funny ad. Um, and we rang the number and really, um, you know, once I probably feel like I dragged um, Paul there, but he certainly dragged me then to the training cause he, um, was definitely on board at the, you know, after the information session. So we loved the whole concept of what foster care uh, was and what we felt we could contribute to that. So our, our first types of placements were um, adolescents and we and we we still love the, the teenage kids now. Um, so I work full time and so does my husband still over this time, but I have flexibility in my work. So I'm a hairdresser and have my own business and um, and I work a couple of days in an office um, set up. So we have it, the support that we can get because we tend to take high school children um, or high primary school children. And so if they're primary school, there's before and after school care, there's support with um, transport if you need it. Um, you know, it's a team effort. Can I tell you, it is just, we're very lucky that we've got all of that support around us because when it's your own children, you really have to, unless you've got great, you know, incredible um, family support around you, um, which we have that as well. So my, my parents have helped out over the years. And as I say, my children that are adults, they certainly help us out when, when needed. So um, I think we're really lucky. That really helps us to continue our foster care um, journey. Because we mainly do that short term, we don't have to worry so much about childcare arrangements, but um, because we, it's weekends or, or whatever. But um, I know that over the years we've done longer term and uh, the childcare support, respite support, there's lots of, um, yeah, lots of options out there. So there's, wherever there's a problem, there's a solution. Um, I, it definitely is not like raising your own. You don't treat them exactly the same as your own. Um, however, when they come into my household, they definitely are part of my family and they feel it straight away. So they certainly don't feel like the extra or the, you know, the add on. Um, I hope that they don't feel like that because we don't, we want them to be definitely welcomed and, and embraced into the, into the family very inclusively. Um, but you have to have an understanding that they had come from a different background, that you haven't raised them since birth. And even babies that come into care have a, can have a traumatic background from utero. So we know this, this is evidence um, based. And so we we try to keep things a bit quiet. We definitely let, let um, I definitely don't have this, a very loud screaming household. When we have a new placement come in, we try to keep things calm. It's just, it's just an attitude that I've, uh, you know, adapted to. My children will say, um, "Mum, you're so calm when we have when we have foster children," and I, I probably am making more of an effort to be calm. You know, you can just be more natural when you don't have extras in the house. Like when your kids come with a play friend, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be that loud and abrupt that when it's a new person that comes into the house. So it's really important to um, be mindful of what sort of scenarios they may have come from. So I let them leave. And if they're loud and abrupt and funny and laugh and whatever, then we sort of definitely, that's that's a normal thing for us. And we enjoy the, the playfulness of what that is. So um, I definitely let them, you know, lead the way in, 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 in how, if they're quiet and subdued and like to have their own space, then we allow that to happen as well. So they are gonna react differently to things than your own children will. Um, and often it's because they don't even know why they, they react that way. So it's it's important to be curious and really, um, you know, talk to your worker and really um, investigate what's going on for them because it's often not the, the behavior that's coming out, it's underneath that. So um, that's all part of the joy. I certainly have learned, I was raised in a, you know, 
I, I would say privileged because I had never been exposed to abuse or um, neglect or, you know, had an incredible, beautiful upbringing with older siblings that also mothered and fathered me as well as my own parents because I was much younger than my siblings. Um, so I'm very lucky in that way. My husband was an only child. So again, you know, uh, we came from a very um, happy background and we're, we're really privileged of that. So the, the kids that come into your care, um, you know, it's not their, it's not anything that they did usually that that has created well, definitely that has created their their situation but what i know is the difference between their parents and us is pure luck they may not have had this you know the supports to wrap around them like we did um you know every family goes through challenging times and the fact that um i came through unscathed and my parents were able to manage what we went through as a family um is a blessing is, is really we're very lucky um, and not every family is so lucky. So if you are come from, you know, something, um, you know, under, you know, less privileged or, or you know, lower socioeconomic or, um, or it, with a disability um, or mental health, you know, there's so much issue out there that's no one's fault. So um, I, there's this incredible video that you'll see that, you know, that we play during the, the, the training that um, shows real interviews with real birth families. And my experience is that it's such a real video because I've met those birth families. I've met families just like them. I've, we've actually um, had coffee and had, you know, like a KFC meal or whatever with, with um, birth families when when it's been appropriate. So that doesn't always happen. Sometimes the workers will take the children and they do what they call contact or visits, you know, that that um, visits with their with their own children. And you might not meet them at all. You might have a communication book and you might be able to write Johnny, you know, um, experience this for the first time. And it's really nice if you can share that um, experience with the birth family as well. You can only imagine how awful it must be that they can't, you know, be raising their children themselves for that period of time. Usually I find they're very grateful for us, really grateful. And if we do have conversations on the phone or in person, they're just so um, kind and happy. And, you know, really um, they look at us like, wow, you you know, how wonderful that you've done that. So I, I've never been abused. I've never been sworn at or, um, you know, had a, a difficult, a challenging relationship with a birth family. Um, I think they save those, those horrible feelings perhaps for the workers that they have to deal with or the police they have to remove the children but for us as foster carers they're very grateful um i've you know have got some beautiful person personal you know presents and plants and different things flowers from cards which i keep all of that um from birth families because it that's we're not just helping the child that's a big part of what we love to do and that's that one-on-one -on -one thing but we're also helping the community and we're helping that whole family and it can really change it can interrupt um, you know, some problems and, and really ch change their um, their direction. So I feel like we make, we're making a big difference within the whole community. Um, so every child that comes into foster care has a bit of a case plan um, and that's an organised plan and it includes the visits with their birth family. And it might not be just mum or dad, or it could be separately or together it could be grandparents and could be sibling um, contact so if they can't all live in the same house let's say grandma can have a couple of the children but can't have them all because you know because of their situational space in the house so it's really lovely if you can go to and we've had this experience um, like an indoor playground or an outdoor playground you know depending on the weather um, and and watch them play together and interact and, and have a cup of coffee and, and walk in their shoes as well a little bit as well so I enjoy that sort of contact um, because of the type of care that we do that fits in well with the respite care that we do um, but most carers if you're having an ongoing placement you may never actually meet them in person because a, a a worker would come and collect the child or pick them up from school they have their contact and then they come back to you and a lot of carers find this quite challenging because the kids can come back very um you know hyped up on sugar because you know it's a visit the, the, the parents are so you know they've missed the children and they want to spoil them rotten and they and they often you know perhaps don't have the great um experience of that so they 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 want to shower them with lollies and treats and the wrong food and whatever so sometimes that's well it's actually really common that that happens I have to say um, so I find that challenging too and I know my friends uh, other carers do find that challenging because they're quite hopped up so I think getting into a routine really quickly when that's happening to you and the visits can be 
twice a week, three times a week. If they're babies, it can be every single day uh, because it's really imp important that the birth family has that, um, you know, that bond as well with the, with the foster child if, if hopefully they're going home one day. So it, it is really important as much as it can be quite a disruption for your family and what you're doing. Um, but I tended to get into a routine and just um, sort of encourage the young person to, you know, maybe that's bath time afterwards and you can they can really calm down with a nice warm bath. Um, you know, after a visit, so, or listening to some music or, you know, just a little bit of alone time. I uh, would ask my children to let them have a bit of space. I wouldn't assume they'd come in and just straight away have dinner, even though it's dinner time, if they weren't hungry, because they probably had eaten, um, but they might not have eaten a really nice meal. So they've eaten like something inappropriate or you know, lollies or chips or whatever. So I would say, right, well, how about you play or do some reading or do what, or do your bath. We're going to have dinner because it's dinner time. The rest of the family's having dinner and I'll save your plate and you and you and I will sit on the table and have some dinner a bit later if you want to. And if they didn't want dinner, that's okay. You know, I, I wasn't hung up on that. They didn't have to, you know, eat afterwards. We just worked around what was um, happening at the time. Yeah, I think what can happen often with um, with children when they've gone through a traumatic experience or traumatic years, they can become very withdrawn and and not want to you know want to spend a lot of time in their room, um, and that's sometimes hard. I, I I try to allow that to a degree, but I definitely keep re-engaging. Um, I think it's really important to give them an option to come out and eventually it's really pretty amazing and heartwarming when you can get, get through that barrier and they can come and mix with the family. And I, we have to, there's sort of some non-negotiables in my household as far as we eat at the dining table. So we don't, um, so a young person can't, even a teenager can, just wants to eat in their room because that's what they're used to. I'm sorry, in my house, we eat dinner at the table and, um, you know, they don't have to talk to us. We'll just have a conversation around them. We try to talk about something good for the day and whatever. And we find eventually they, they you know, they join into those conversations. But that can be challenging because you, you're always thinking um, what's going on in their head. What I have learned to is, and please, if you're looking at being a foster carer, definitely always remember this. It is not personal. So if they are withdrawn and quiet or... Um, you know, reacting in a way that you're like, why are they doing that or swearing or whatever's happening for them at that time? It's not personal. It's not you that they're swearing at. It's not you that they um, don't want to talk to or, or have one want to have nothing to do with. It's it's what's going on for them. So I try to be patient as well and really wait them out. And hopefully that you know the time that they're with us, that very quickly they can they can feel a lot better about that. We um, Another uh, behaviour that's quite common is them being over affectionate. So um, non-discriminate in their, um, you know, they come running straight in your door and run up and give you the biggest hug. And it can actually be quite warming and, and, and lovely, but it's also a bit, um, dis, you know, like a, a bit of a shock sometimes to some people that that, that, that children can behave like that. So um, I don't make a big deal. I don't sort of push them away. I'm I'm a very warm, cuddly person. You know, I love a cuddle myself, so I don't have a problem with that. But I'm mindful of those that don't want to cuddle and I definitely won't, won't force um, myself. Boys is probably very common, you know, like um, that will sort of want that distance. And it might just be like a tap on the shoulder eventually. And I try to work towards that because it's really wonderful if eventually they they have gone through those um, that that emotion and, and then eventually become that connected person. I had a carer tell me that um, the young person we had for emergency then went to her care and she said, you know how he described, you couldn't remember your name, but he just he just said, you know, the carer that smiles all the time. I was the smiley carer. That was like his nickname for me. And I just went, wow, at least I wasn't the carer that, um, I don't know, that had the awful hairdo or that, um, you know, that was, I don't know, you know, something negative, but um, he was, I was the carer that smiled all the time. And I just thought that's a bit of warmth that you can, that's free, right? You can just be, it's so welcoming, no matter the culture or whatever, you can just be quite welcoming with a smile and, you know, just a gentle approach. So yeah, important to, to remember. I am, um, Sometimes, how to say goodbye to a, to a child that's lived with you. I think for us, we've ta taken more of the shorter term sort of placements. So I know 
that reunification is at the end of that placement. I didn't start fostering to grow my family. I didn't want to adopt 20 children. Um, neither did my husband, definitely not. We've got two of our own and we feel very blessed with, with our two children. However, some children stay longer um, and it's been, you know, definitely our choice in that um, it's worked well and that's why we're able to extend beyond the original um, commitment time that we might have said yes to. Um, some kids, it's, uh, look, you definitely need to debrief sometimes when they leave and that's when usually a peer foster carer to talk to about that, who's somebody who really gets it and a cup of tea or a glass of wine and, um, you know, a few tears later can be um, really helpful. I, I have a beautiful um, memory of a boy that lived with us for three months who actually stayed in my life anyway, but when he moved out of living with us full time after three or four months, um, my, my very close friend that's a foster carer lived just around the corner from where his mum lives. And um, I dropped him off and he, you know, gave me this beautiful necklace that he had in his bedroom that, he, you know, to say thank you. And it was just a really beautiful um, reunification. It was really lovely. Mum was in a great space and that's where he belonged. You know, that was his mum. So that I had to really draw on that, the fact that it was really import, important that he goes back to his mum. That's his, that's his life. That's his family, you know. We were really lucky that mum was very open to us having him back for regular respite. But anyway, I, 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 I was very upset when he first left us and went straight to my friend's house and we had, um, yeah, an afternoon, you know, debriefing session and lots of tears and lots of laughter. And um, that was sort of really helpful for me to get through that moment before I had to take the long drive home. But he came back to us over the holidays and over weekends. And this is a boy who's now turning 26 this year and was in my daughter's wedding party in December because she got married in December and he was um, her husband's groomsman. Uh, so he definitely has been part of our life since he was 10 years old. So we're very lucky with that. That doesn't always happen. You don't know where they go to. Um, I'm open to being in touch with um, a lot of, particularly when they're adolescents. So we might be Facebook friends and whatever. That's my choice. You might choose not to do that, but I've enjoyed seeing, uh, watching them grow and have children themselves. So I'm a foster grandmother to, to many um, foster grandchildren. <laughs> so, and that's a blessing. I, I love that. For me, that's a joy. Um, I think it, this is where I say it's such a privilege to be a foster carer, to watch that change, to hit those milestones. Um, we have had children arrive to our doorstep that have been so withdrawn and so shy, um, just and quite sad. And to watch them finally have some eye contact with you or laugh out loud or they dictate, they tell us a joke at the dinner table after a few days. and just to start to feel comfortable, you know, and then you have the joy of experiencing those first experiences with them. It might be their first circus they've ever been to or movie, drive-in cinema, you know, like there's some great experiences that don't have to cost a lot of money, but can be so um, amazing. So you're, you're giving them memories that they'll have for the rest of their life, you know, um, that nobody can take that away. They might eventually be reunified with family and with some supports, their, fa their family life is good. It might not be as wonderful as your household, but it's good, right? Because it's their family and that's what's really important. But they're not gonna take away those memories that they had of those the first time that, that you took them on a train or you know, whatever. With um, the boy that I spoke about before that we had for three months, we, we had a lot of his first because mum, we had him for respite for the next uh, you know, eight years officially and then ongoing. He's 26 uh, this year, so we've certainly had him ongoingly. But he, um, you know, his, his first football game, his first, um, he, my husband loved the wrestling and so did he. So the first wrestling match that they went to, they loved that. They loved doing that together. Um, baseball, he, he, he joined a baseball team because we were a baseball family. Um, those first, and then when he was 17, we went on an aeroplane just to Sydney and we watched the major league come out to Sydney. Um, and so he, watching him experience his first plane flight, my children had been on a plane since they were babies, really. We'd, we'd done a lot of travel through our lives, um, but this boy had never been on a, on a plane before. So how amazing that, you know, he's just watching us go up and not scared or nervous. He was just enjoying it. And I was just watching him. I just thought it was an incredible experience just to watch him. So he's since traveled lots and he's now living in the UK for a couple of years. So he's doing lots and lots of travel, which is wonderful. And I like to say that we, um, 
we were the first that sort of introduced that to him. But um, I just think those little things, and it's often not a big obvious thing. It might just be you reading with them every night and all of a sudden the, the penny drops and the reading becomes more fluid um, and they're able to really, to watch them grow and learn you know, their their brains are sponges and they just enjoy that sort of thing. I've taught kids how to braid hair. I've taught kids how to, you know, throw and catch a ball. Like those sort of incredible experiences that people take for granted, um, you know, what a privilege. Anyway, that's what I say. What a privilege to be able to experience those with, with um, not just your own children, but these beautiful foster children.